This program has been made possible by a grant from the UCF Office of Research and Commercialization. The UCF Office of Research and Commercialization is committed to moving the discoveries of our faculty and students from ideas to innovation to realization. By moving research from the laboratory to the private sector, we are helping to diversify Florida's economy and helping to bring high paying jobs to our state. This program presents some examples of our research and our efforts to transition this research to the private sector. Hello and welcome to Zenith, our program of and about research at the University of Central Florida. I'm your host, Ed Hyland. In this half hour, we continue my interview with Jay Hickman, director of the Nanoscience Technology Center. You'll be amazed at the work his group is doing with spinal cord regeneration. But first, we'll take a look into the future, and the future is our students. The Progress Energy Senior Design Forum is a showcase for final class projects that often lay the foundation for future scientific and engineering research. Students worked during their senior year with faculty advisors to develop innovative product proposals, conduct the design analysis, design and build a prototype, and prepare engineering reports. They also gave a public presentation at the symposium. We focused on three projects that caught our eye, starting with an updated take on an older technology, a solar trough that can generate electricity or distill water using the power of the sun. What we have right here is a smaller version of our solar parabolic trough. Um, it was designed to go to developing countries such as Africa, as well as disaster ridden countries such as Haiti, to help uh, produce uh, energy with the help of an organic ranking cycle or to produce clean water with the help of a desalination group. Uh, the actual one that uh, we designed and created is located by the Siemens building. It's about eight feet wide by about 20 feet long. It sits about five feet above the ground. Um, on our peak, it about, produces about eight kilowatts of power, but on average produces about six kilowatts of power per day. Of course, with efficiencies that will be dropped down to about one per day due to the organic banking cycle. Um, we have a solar track on it, which will actually allow for the trough to stay perpendicular to the sun at all aspects of the day. And what happens is the sun actually hits here, reflects to the focal point, which is where the copper pipe is located, and heats a working fluid on the inside. The working fluid is actually then passed to the other two groups in conjunction with heat exchangers to power those systems. Um, we have a small pump that pumps the whole liquid. It's variable speed, so it varies from a half a gallon per minute up to four and a quarter. There are so many small nuances that you don't even really think about, um, such as our first creation of it, the, actually the edge of the troughs didn't actually sit flat, and it's kind of bubbling, which actually reduced in our efficiency. We had to go in and re-stiffen them. The fact that these don't actually stay clean, so every day you gotta go out and wipe them, because that actually reduces from the amount of heat um, even safety being a factor of you don't really think about it, but then you kind of step back and go, oh, we got potentially 150 to 200 degrees C fluid pumping through at like three gallons per minute. So you got to kind of assess that and put in um, pressure vessels and pressure gauges on that so that doesn't blow. You know, it's little tiny things like that stuff. So even coming down to, okay, now I have my trough up there, it's five feet, but it's casting a shadow, which means I have to remove a ball. How do I remove a plank of wood that's now five feet in the air and I'm four feet away from it? It creates little tiny challenges. I mean, you laughed because she remembers how we did it. We got up and took a circular saw and just cut off our balancing. Commercially, yes. Um, this one that you see in front um, is about half the size of one of our troughs and can be used to heat a, a swimming pool. So residentially, it's viable. If you have an open enough field, like in Nevada, they have actually have a field that produces eight megawatts of power using troughs that are actually larger than the ones we have produced. So they're also more technically advanced using evacuated glass tubes rather than just copper piping and insulation. They have precision cut metal ribs as opposed to ours, which are cut with a jig and metal and used wood paneling. So it is commercially viable and it is actually a good alternative to what's out there. It's just a matter of actually, you know, finding the space for them. Because as you can see, they're all kind of big and when the sun does hit them, it is kind of bright. So it could potentially be on the large scale a nuisance to people. But on the small scale like this, it's really not a problem. The small version of the solar trough will travel to Haiti this summer 
to help earthquake victims in need of clean water and power. And another group of students came up with a unique concept that might allow us to recycle the energy produced by trains as they speed through tunnels. Perhaps you've experienced that whoosh sensation or pressure as a train or subway zips into an underground station. Imagine harnessing that power. One group of UCF students did. We understand that for uh, high-speed trains, when they go in the train tunnels, there's a big buildup of pressure. And uh, what engineers decided to do to alleviate that pressure was to install ventilation shafts in all train systems to alleviate that big buildup of pressure so there's not a, uh, a huge discomfort on the, on the passengers or on the train or uh, drag that uh, requires a lar uh, an increase in energy consumption by the train itself. So our idea was to actually uh, install uh, uh, wind turbines inside of the ventilation shafts and to see if we could actually harness energy to, so that we can actually put energy back into the grid. What we did was we used a scaled down experiment uh, where we were able to actually launch our train models up to 165 miles per hour, true speed. Um, so we were able to simulate what would actually happen for real applications by using uh, real velocities and similar uh, relationships such as the blockage ratio, which is the area of the the, uh, the train to the area of the tunnel. We did it for three different train systems, uh, high speed, freight cargo, and subway systems. And uh, what we found was that for subway systems, they, uh, they don't have as much as a, ma a big peak in magnitude of pressure, but they have more frequency for trains. So the subway system uh, was the most beneficial because, for instance, if you look at New York subway trains, they can pass any one air shaft at any particular time, 300 times per day. And uh, what we found was that we can actually save 0.53 kilowatt hours per air shaft just for one train passing through at 70 miles per hour for subway system. And then if you do that 300 times a day, we get up to around 159 kilowatt hours per day. And then over uh, annually, uh, we would be able to save around $7,500 uh, per year for one air shaft. And uh, there's multiple air shafts in any tunnel section. Next stop for the train project is to actually install a small energy generator turbine in a train tunnel air shaft to see how it works. Another student team showcased its small-scale wind turbine, which can be installed in a home to generate electricity converted from the wind. That ultimately will reduce home power costs. Our idea is basically to have a blade that pivots on an axis, and it can change from drag mode to start into lift mode at higher speeds. Basically, a lift turbine always needs an external source of energy to start up. So by having it turn from drag into lift, you can have the turbine start up mechanically by itself without an external energy source. And if wind speeds are high and sustained, it can still gain the higher energy curve of a lift turbine. And this would mainly be applied for uh, small uh, or residential areas, small business or residential areas. Um, in turbulent flow, because it's a vertical turbine, it can handle flow in any direction. It doesn't have to adjust for that and it doesn't lose any energy for that. Um, so it's really based around like a, a small business or residential, like I said. The vertical axis wind turbine is also undergoing additional testing to improve efficiency. Our congratulations to all the seniors. And when you see some of these designs in your local home improvement store, remember you saw it on Zenith first. Still to come, how nanoscience is taking a very different look at spinal cord injuries and how to reconnect these critical nerve endings. Stay with us.
UCF Business Incubation Program is a university-driven community partnership. Entrepreneur Magazine says Orlando has one of the most highly coordinated entrepreneurial engines in the country, and it all started with the UCF Business Incubation Program. The goal is to get something out in, in the marketplace or get something published or patented that really uh, benefits society providing companies with the enabling tools to create financially stable, high-growth enterprises. Um, portable MP3 players, uh, you can carry them everywhere, of course, but they don't have the appeal. Large, high-quality stereo systems are too heavy to haul around. And basically, we created a robot that plays music while it follows the user. Um, it's voice activated, meaning it's hands-free. It grants the user the freedom to perform um, highly involved tasks without having to uh, stop what they're doing and change tracks if they want to. So as far as the sound quality comparison, it's going to be pretty close to right on par. Um, our design incorporates two LCD displays. One is for displaying track information as, such as a uh, track title and artist. Um, we also want to display our playlist and any menus for user configuration. Um, it tracks the user with IR sensors, it avoids obstacles with uh, ultrasonic sensors, and it's designed to be a turtle. The mission of the Office of Technology Transfer at the University of Central Florida is to proactively facilitate the transfer of technology from the university to the commercial sector through enlightened technology transfer policies. Processes that efficiently and effectively reduce off-the-shelf technology inventory and dedication to customers and being easy to do business with. Our guiding principles are development of intellectual property assets licensing them into the commercial sector, which leads to a return on investment for the university. We envision an eventual contribution to the economic development within the Central Florida region, the state, and the nation. UCF will be recognized as a contributor and leader in the future economic performance of the Central Florida region. On our last program, we were talking with Dr. Jay Hickman about how his work in nanoscience may lead to new insights into diseases like ALS and Alzheimer's. But as is so often the case in science, his research is also opening new doors to finding ways to study other conditions like spinal cord injury. One of the big problems has been is that in clinical trials, people have focused on people who have Alzheimer's disease. And because there's no way of really picking out who's going to develop Alzheimer's beforehand. So part of it also is that the clinical trials that actually have occurred um, really didn't target the right population. Okay? So another aspect of that would be more clinical trials and better clinical trials, which again cost more money. Um, the problem is you really have to focus on companies for that. And, and, and again, in a whole in the business climate, that, that's also a problem as well. But, you know, certainly... Um, you know, more money on a statewide level, certainly at a, a federal level, um, would be helpful because you have all these competing theories out there right now. Um, and, and a lot of it is, is also they're not really focusing on the translational aspects of as much, the more the engineering aspects of building better systems. I mean, we still work in, as I said earlier, our, the focus of our group is to try and figure out something between a single cell and an animal or a human. There's very few tests out there that are doing that. So pretty much right now you do single cell experiments, okay, and then you go into an animal. And whether or not your animal or, you know, um, is, is representative of the disease, um, you're not really sure. And because we've cured, you know, 200 diseases in mice that haven't translated to humans. Um, and so, so part of it is, 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 yeah, more money, but also maybe refocusing a little bit more on developing better technologies versus just beating to death the same technologies that exist, that have been existing for the last 20 years. 
if we could change gears just for a moment, sure. I did want to talk about your uh, work with uh, spinal cords. Uh, just in our brief discussion, uh, I, I used the term regenerate, uh, uh, you know, uh, spinal cords, and, and I guess the functionality. And uh, and and you said yes, all of the above. So uh, let's go with that. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, how the nanoscience is is really starting to uh, to take a look at this. It, it, it's unlike Alzheimer's, which is obviously a disease and, and something that many people face. Hopefully, spinal cord injuries uh, are not something that people are going to be facing unless they're you know met with a catastrophe, an accident of some type. Well, but the nice thing is again, and that kind of goes to one of the other systems we're developing, which is a motor control deficit model, which is looking at the reflex arc and how that um, uh, functions, okay? So that basically is, is the thing, when you go into a doctor's office and he whacks you on your knee, he's testing your reflex arc, okay? So what he's doing is he's stretching a tendon, okay, which causes a muscle to stretch, which then sends a, single, a, sens a, neuro, a, neuro, uh, a, a signal through a sensory neuron, um, which then signals a motor neuron, which is your active part of the, the system, to cause the muscle to contract, and your knee kicks. And so that loop, is something that's involved in spinal cord injury, but it's also involved in things like um, Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, uh, spinal muscle atrophy, neuropathic pain, um, muscle wasting diseases, are all involved in that loop. And so what we're hoping is we can actually look at um, not only injury models, but disease models, okay, uh, in terms of um, the, the motor control circuit. And so we've recently been able to, we just had a couple of papers published where we've been able to take um, uh, spinal cord neurons from animals and to get them to grow. These are from adult animals and get them to grow in a dish. Um, and we do this by actually treating them with nanoparticles, okay, these catalytic antioxidant nanoparticles. Um, because, in effect, one of the things that you're doing um, when you're trying to culture out adult tissue is you're introducing a massive ischemic event. Okay, you're depriving them of, of, of oxygen, you're hitting with lots of free radicals and everything, which is why other labs haven't been able to do it. Okay? But the nanoparticles kind of eat up all the free radicals okay, as around this tissue, so we're we'll able to actually replate it. We've actually been able to show that we can actually get it to regenerate. Okay? So not only to live, but to also regain its electrical activities. So where it can actually stimulate and make muscles twitch, or myofibrils twitch now in a dish again. Um, and we've done this with a new approach by treating it not only with these things called growth factors, which are things that help re tissue recover, but also neurotransmitters, okay? And neurotransmitters, people have thought for a long time, were just useful for conveying signals back and forth between neurons. Well, it turns out they actually might actually uh, be involved in this regenerative process as well. And so it was only by treating them with neurotransmitters after treating with growth factors we saw full recovery of function. So one of the things that, that has occurred in, in, in some of the things that I was reading indicated that you have damage mm -hmm. that is in a certain place. A lot of times there's inflammation involved and can actually dam destroy mm -hmm. uh, cells that are mm -hmm. in, in the place there. When you talk about regenerate, uh, where I'm going is do you have enough of the existing cells to be able to make something work or do you actually have to get into a point where there will be additional cells introduced to make it work again as it normally did? Pretty much all of that. So, so what happens when I talked about this massive ischemic event? So this happens, say, during stroke or during injury. What happens is you have your initial injury and then cells die or are injured because of that. But then if you deprive them from oxygen or, or, or other factors are released by cells that come and try and clean up the damage, they cause what is called secondary injury, okay? And they start killing the cells around it, okay? Um, and that is something that we're trying to learn how to prevent. Okay, so you don't have the secondary injury, so you can recover better, recover faster, not get as much damage. Um, but then sometimes, you know, especially for older um, um, injuries or for really traumatic injuries, you've lost the tissue. And so we're also working with stem cells to try and recreate stem cells in a dish that um, turn into motor neurons. So we just had another paper that was published recently where we can take a stem cell and create a functional human motor neuron. Okay, and we're working on trying to put those into animal models right now to see whether or not we can hasten recovery from a spinal cord injury. I was going to say, are you moving into the animal model yeah. realm there? And do animal models, at least as far as spinal cords go, is that, is that a more reliable model for you than, say, something like an Alzheimer's? Well, yeah, because it's a straight injury. Okay, um, the problem is you're mixing matching cells, right? You're putting human cells into an animal. Now, we recently just showed that we could actually get a human motor neuron 
derived from a stem cell to a synapse onto a rat myotube in a dish. So we proved that you can actually do that because people hadn't been able to show that before. You know, they didn't know whether or not that they put a human cell in, into an animal model, whether or not it would actually form synaptic connections to muscle or not. So we now know that's possible. So that at least allows us to go in and figure out, okay, naturally what's going on. Whereas if you're making a transgenic animal or something else like that, you're going and you're tinkering with its genome to, to ho hopefully have it have the same sort of deficits that exist, you know, in the human being after they get a disease, okay? That's a lot harder to predict than simply just an animal model where you're, you're injuring it. You think that that's pretty close to injuring a human being. And you would get the same sort of response in the animal, okay, that you would get in human beings. So we believe that's probably a little bit closer than it would be than, than an Alzheimer's model where you're creating a transgenic where you're adding in different genes that you're hoping will reproduce this effect. And on another medical front, Dr. Hickman and Dr. Stephen Lambert at the UCF College of Medicine received a four-year grant worth nearly $2 million to create test beds needed to study conditions like multiple sclerosis. Miss a Zenith program? Check out our archives online at www.ucf.tv and then scroll down the program guide to Zenith. We'd also like to hear from you with questions or comments about this or any other program on UCF TV. My email is on our website, eHighland at mail.ucf.edu. The goal of research is to better understand the world around us. Our goal is to be a window to that world. For Zenith, I'm Ed Highland.